final session of the day. Um, in um, thinking about this particular session relative to the previous sessions, we've been looking, if, if you will, somewhat retrospectively to what committees have achieved over the past year. Um, this last session is going to be a bit more prospective, if you will, in thinking about and discussing how we can meet current and pending human and environmental health challenges. And to help us with this discussion, we have three guests who are sitting here with me. And they are um, Melissa Meeker, who is the Executive Director of the Water Environment Research Foundation and Water Reuse Research Foundation. Uh, Catherine Kreis, who is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at PATH. And finally, Heather Chani, who is the Foundation's Relation and Strategy Advisor for the Family Health International Foundation. Now, what we'd like to do with our three guests is um, engage them in some productive conversation about their challenges and successes and so on and so forth. But in order to do that, I'm going to be quiet for a bit, and I'm going to start with Melissa and ask you then to each take a few minutes to specifically describe the group that you work with um, and the kinds of things that you do, and then we will begin to have a, a broader discussion from there. So, Melissa. Thank you very much. Um, as she mentioned, uh, I'm the executive director of the, actually, the Water Environment and Reuse Foundation. Um, what you see up there is the former two organizations, <laughs> which we just merged within the last month. Um, so we merged uh, the Water Environment Research Foundation, which you may have heard of, WARF, um, as well as the Water Reuse Research Foundation, which fo both of those organizations really focused on what I'll tag, and I shouldn't use this, but once wasted water. So all the things that we want to get, we wanted to dispose of, either wastewater or stormwater. Um, and looking at those under a new lens of given where we are really with all kinds of things, energy demands, water demands, uh, climate change and all different kinds of things, what kind of resources can we pull out of those, including water, energy, nutrients, et cetera. So taking once wasted water and actually providing value to it in a, frankly, in a society where we don't necessarily value water until we hear about Flint or we don't have it when we turn on the tap. So it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, the majority of our membership, 60% of our membership are, are water utilities, so wastewater utilities and stormwater utilities from around the U.S. Uh, we have some very strong partnerships in Australia and Singapore um, are, who are international members. Um, and then the other members are engineering firms, uh, technology providers, service providers uh, that work in the field. Uh, about 40% of our research, which is about six to eight million dollars a year, um, is funded using dues, uh, our membership dues. Uh, the other 60% comes from federal funding, so EPA is a huge supporter of ours, the Bureau of Reclamation, um, and state uh, agencies as well. So really focused on applied research, uh, looking at human health and the protection of the environment as um, it relates to either taking out a waste stream that's now polluting a downstream water body, uh, treating that water so that it can be used by downstream communities or even directly within a community um, and also harvesting stormwater and using it and, and capturing as much value out of that uh, wasted water that we can. Okay, thank you. Um, Catherine. Great. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I'm Catherine Price. I work for PATH, which is not CPATH. I was specifically told to say that. Um, our, our, our organization is based in Seattle, Washington. It used to stand for the Program for Appropriate Technologies in Health. And we really are an organization where about 1,400 people. We work in about 70 countries. Our mandate is really to improve global health. We're a health organization. Um, but increasingly, as we are getting into the environment of the Sustainable Development Goals, and there is, I think, a new push now to really integrate different types of development um, that we as a you know, global community are working on. Uh, we're very much interested in what's going on in climate change, which because that has everything to do with the environment, which has everything to do with agriculture, which has everything to do with health. And so these sort of new linkages. Um, we work in five areas. We work on drug development, diagnostics, uh, new vaccines, 
devices and tools, and then something we call systems and services innovation, which is really about demand creation for these things. So we're very much in um, the middle of the value chain, if you will. And I think one of the things that we do do very well is we, we actually partner quite a bit with industry. So we uh, work quite a lot with Big Pharma. We work with lots of uh, technology-oriented organizations. We were started because of the market failure for uh, technologies that were appropriate uh, in health in developing countries. And um, increasingly, we are um, really interested in, in expanding what we're doing with the intersection between environment and health and have, um, are in the process of developing some new models. So I actually run an incubator within PATH uh, on nutrition innovation. And of course, nutrition has everything to do with climate and ag and environment and health. And so we're, we're setting up some new models, uh, largely working with some private sector people, thinking about carbon credits and, and health offsets that might help uh, to refund some of these programs. And then what are the outcomes that would be uh, both conservation and oriented as well as oriented towards improving uh, health and, and nutrition and in some cases sort of women's economy. Okay. Thank you. And finally, Heather. Well, first of all, I want to thank Melissa for her work because I hail from Flint, Michigan. So uh, very much appreciate good water treatment and, <laughs> and planning. Um, and, and also uh, Catherine's point on, on looking at a more integrated approach to development. Um, the Family FHI Foundation, Family Health International Foundation, is interesting in how it was created and um, even more so than what we do now um, because it was, a, it was a result, it was actually created in 1990, so it's about 25 years old, 26 years old, um, as a result of a sale of a for-profit clinical research company that was majority owned by a non-profit organization. Um, so very interesting model and it was created, uh, the, the Clinical Research International was the name of the company. It was one of the first publicly traded CROs um, and it was actually created by Family Health International in 1986 as, a, as kind of they, they faced an urgent need to diversify their revenue and realized that the large scale clinical trials they were conducting in reproductive health products in, in Africa would actually apply to pharmaceutical companies here. So providing that platform for clinical research trials. Um, they, uh, so they started the company, um, grew it, and then sold it four years later, resulting in the creation of Family Health International Foundation. It is a separate independent foundation. Um, we have a separate board. It does support the mission and the work of now, what's now called FHI 360. I'll talk a little bit about that name change. Um, and some of the biggest impacts that the foundation has had, I mean, they, they're really um, promoting investments, utilizing the skills and expertise of, of FHI 360 to advance, shape, and change the way that we approach human development um, initiatives. So one of the biggest impacts to date of the foundation funding was um, the, the um, investing in um, three demonstration projects for AR antiretroviral therapy in Kenya, Ghana, and Rwanda. And basically the impetus behind these investments was to provide the evidence base that was needed to show that ARVs could be delivered in low resource settings effectively and have um, life-saving impacts. So those demonstration projects, a million dollars were invested, resulted in you know, bringing along some big government funding such as USAID and DFID and, and the Global Fund to fight AIDS and tuberculosis and others. And you know, today it has resulted in tens of millions of lives saved and improved. So you know, we wouldn't claim that that was all of us. It was in partnership with many other organizations, but we do see a unique role that we played in providing that evidence in those initial demonstration projects. So we, we continue to want to do that and um, it led to about 2011, the foundation put up some assets to acquire another um, nonprofit called Academy for Educational Development, resulting in now an organization that really takes a holistic approach to human health and well-being, looking at education, environment, um, economic development, and civil society. So right now our, our big push and in, in investment is in integrated approaches to development 
So we are very much in line with what Catherine said at PATH. So you, you actually, if I can have you guys do one more thing, just broadly, um, you, you sort of broached it already, Heather, but I want to give you an opportunity to brag a little bit. Um, if you think about what your organization has done, what are the one or two things that you're really proud of that the, the organization has achieved? We'll, we'll play the Jeopardy theme while you think for a second. But I just really, I think you, you kind of captured the essence of the group. But I, I'd, I'd really like to give you an opportunity to, to talk a little bit, you know, about the things that you're really proud of. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's I mentioned that our organization is focused on applied research. So although the media and, um, you know, the media makes such a big deal about specific cases, as they should, don't get me wrong, there are thousands of utilities in the U.S. that operate safely, that provide good, clean drinking water, that take your wastewater away and treat it adequately, <coughs> um, you know, to protect the environment. So, I mean, I, I think our 25 plus years experience working with those agencies to make sure they're doing what they should be doing and using the best technologies and the best protocols um, is something to be proud of. Now for PATH, I mean, we are inherently an innovative organization. We grew, our roots grew out of that. We're 40 years old. We, our, our head uh, uh, of PATH actually left and went to the Gates Foundation where I first met him. I, I, I worked there for 10 years. And gosh, we've done so many cool things. I mean, the organization <laughs> really has done some amazing things. When we, some of them are things like, um, uh, you know, we're in the process of putting together a malaria vaccine, a vaccine against malaria. We've done um, some work on Japanese encephalitis. We did human papillomavirus. Uh, we have some uh, technologies for assessing um, cervical cancer in low-income settings. Um, those little blue dots, for those of you that are clinicians or have worked in, in giving uh, vaccines, that tell you when a vial has been out of the cold chain uh, too long and the dot turns blue, we did that. Um, and increasingly, we're working on using some of the technologies that we've, that we've used for vaccine development um, in human populations for livestock. And we're very interested in low environmental footprint animal source foods because we know that there is a, that sort of a global trend where people are demanding more, more uh, animal, animal protein. And what we really want to try and do is, is provide some um, uh, access to them for um, animal source proteins that are Low, low environmental footprint, for example, eggs, uh, poultry, um, in some cases rodents, and we think probably edible insects is another area. So all of these sort of new, new things that we're working on. So, yeah, thank you. Well, I already bragged a little bit, um, <laughs> so <laughs> got ahead of the game. Um, but I, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm most proud of and that I would say that our board is starting to become a little less humble about is just the unique nature of how the foundation came to be and, and the timing that they did it. I would say, you know, getting ahead of, of a problem and really having the vision to see what their, what their particular value add would be in addressing that problem and then creating unique structures and unique partnerships when it wasn't really popular to do so. I mean, in the mid 80s, there was no way that nonprofit organizations were out talking about how we form proactive private sector partnerships to enhance human development goals. So, you know, and, and that's part of the reason why not many people know about the foundation because they didn't want to talk about that, those partnerships too much at the time. Um, but, but now it's becoming kind of a topic du jour with, you know, the social impact investing and how do we leverage new sorts of, you know, resources and innovative financing to, to advance goals and, and, and work in, in more interesting and unique collaboration with private sector partners. Um, so this is, this is something that I think the foundation can really brag about and show that over the 30 years that it's existed with an initial $250,000 investment has really resulted in some, um, some major impacts and catalytic impacts at that. So that's something that we're really, really proud of. So I, I want to open it up for some qu for questions from the audience in just a moment, but I almost feel, Heather, like you're my straight man, um, in that um, you, I think one of the things that we'd like to learn from you all a little bit about is um, 
how you all have worked to develop successful partnerships. So you, you started on that now. Um, any kind of insight as to the kinds of things that have really worked well for you in developing an, a really productive and successful, um, I'll call it multidisciplinary, multi-sector partnership? Yeah, I mean, I would say that change is t difficult for all of us human beings, um, unless you're like an innovative entrepreneur, perhaps, and that's something you feed on. Um, so what, what has resulted in you know, these unique structures and, and what has moved the organization forward has really been a sense of urgency, whether it was real or whether it was self-inflicted um, urgency. They said that if we don't address this right now, and if we aren't the ones to address it, then there could be some serious implications for the planet and for the populations that we care about. So definitely injecting that sense of urgency um, and then getting the right people at the table to understand how to address that problem so I would say the bold champions, really the right people who can take an idea forward and, and push into new ways and new frontiers, but then also the element of risk. Um, you know, being able to take risk um, where go where el no one else is really willing or, or comfortable going. Those have probably been the three elements that have worked the most effectively for the organization. And I don't say that we do that well all the time. Um, in fact, we're even now struggling with how do we take big, bold risks knowing that we have this massive organization that we're trying to support and knowing that we have now an endowment that we're trying to maintain in perpetuity. It makes the game a little bit different in taking those risks. So constantly trying to remember how we originated and in injecting that creativity and vision and maybe a little bit of sense of urgency in what we do. Okay, Catherine, Melissa? Yeah, I mean, I, we're always looking for sort of the win-win. And when we're looking for rolling out, you know, um, new vaccines or new diagnostics or new drugs or um, even some kind of a device or tool like a, a, a cook stove, um, of high efficiency cook stove, for example. We're really trying to engage in a way that helps to reduce the risk for either the public sector or the private sector, and usually both, to get involved. And so that means finding out what's driving those, those motives. And in the case of the public sector, it's often we really want to get our products out there. We need to make sure that there's a, uh, enough of a supply for them. We want to make sure that the demand is in place. Uh, and we want to make sure that they're affordable. And for the private sector, it's like, well, we want to make sure that uh, if we're going to produce these, that there's going to be a market for them and that we're going to be able to make a profit off of them. And so we work very hard to find sort of creative ways to put those things into place where uh, the, the incentives are in aligned such that there, it's a win for the public sector, it's a win for the private sector, and most notably, it's a win for, uh, for, for public health and, you know, at an individual perspective or a national perspective. I'm going to uh, go back to the first point of crisis because I think that that's been a, a key driver for our industry. When you look at uh, the drought in California and the very distinct possibility that there would be no water and you certainly couldn't build a desalination plant fast <coughs> enough to address the needs for drinking water in your house. Um, that drove a lot of the conversation and we were able five plus years ago to pull together the experts, the right people to really roadmap the research that needed to be done so that we could go to a direct potable drinking water, so taking wastewater and making it drinking water. Um, what research needed to be done in order to make that safe and you look at communities like Wichita Falls in Texas, which implemented a project based on the research that we did in the previous years. It was that ex expert panel, it was the roadmap they laid out, and it was the crisis that really got us to question and push the envelope when even the public was like, whoa, toilet to tap, we don't want, we don't want this, how do, we, you know, how do we address this? So all of that research coming together um, and looking at that roadmap and, and being proactive enough to have the solution there when a couple of our communities in Texas really needed it, um, I think is essential. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for those answers. Appreciate it. They didn't know any of these were coming, for the record. Um, so um, to, the, to the audience, any questions, comments for the panelists? So speak up or go to the mic. <laughs> Clearly, you have to do if you're going to make bold moves. 
Um, but when you take risks, they're not always successful. And I like your success stories, but could you give us an example where something wasn't successful and what you learned from that experience? Anybody? I, I can give you a lot of examples. I mean, we. We, uh, we, have a, we have a very large pipeline of things that we try to work on and we uh, are very critical along that pipeline so that uh, when things, we, we, when we fail, we want to fail early at least, you know, so we're, we're sort of trying to say like, okay, well, you know, if this doesn't work, uh, you know, either we have to tweak it and fix it or we just have to knock that off. And we have a bunch of things that we've tried or we've, you know, we've, we've gotten to the point where we're like, yeah, this this is not it's not it's not gonna it's it's not gonna happen, and I mean there were things like like some of the the first um, female condoms for example are things that are, are were like that lots and lots of of drugs and uh, and diagnostic tools and vaccines that you know we're, we never get to a, a stage three we not sometimes we don't get a stage one trial but we're really working on trying to figure out um, you know how do we cut our losses early and and de-risk that for later on and so our pipeline looks like a funnel like it would in industry and often we're trying to uh, work with industry partners to figure out what are the impediments um, that will make something work you know from the, from the get-go so we're doing a lot of market analysis to begin with we're doing analysis in terms of uh, n not just you know demographic and, and uh, health analysis but also what's going on with economics what are governments thinking that sort of thing <coughs> trying to mitigate the risk but but we probably I mean I, I can assure you we have more failures than 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 home runs for sure and what we try to do is fail early. I think that's our, that's, that's the way we want Yeah, and I can, I can just build on what Catherine said. I think there's probably been two key areas, not, not where we've failed, but where we've learned, you know, maybe not going in the direction we had intended it to and, or, and readjusted and, you know, or found a new path or a new course. And there's two examples, but the common theme is they were, they were both examples of where we thought we could do it alone we could do it internally. So, you know, and, and I'm speaking on behalf of the foundation that supports an organization called FHI 360, which is, you know, it's, it's 4,800 people in 70 countries and in all 50 states. So it's a huge organization. So you'd think that we could do it alone. You know? and, and I think that the two examples, one is the reason why they created a for-profit spin-off, Clinical Research International, was because at the time, Family Health International could not do this alone. They couldn't do it internally. You had family planning, reproductive health specialists focused on Africa, and now being tasked with providing you know, clinical research you know, the, the task of doing a clinical research study in the United States for statin drugs. You know, it's a completely different game. Um, and so they had to create a for-profit entity separate from the organization. Still majority owned by the organization, but building something separate and, and drawing the right experts in to drive that. And, and the same thing currently, I mean, similar, we, we, are, we have an innovation fund, it's called the Catalyst Fund, it's a half a million dollars a year to support innovation um, and entrepreneurship within FHI 360. And, you know, we're looking at researchers that are used to responding to RFPs for the most part, and it's really hard to inject that entrepreneurial spirit and the business acumen that they may need to, to take a, a pilot and, and scale it up. So we're actually readjusting how we do the Catalyst Fund and bringing external technical assistance um, to work with our, our Catalyst awardees, as we call them. And we're even thinking about ways in which we could, we could perhaps provide those Catalyst grants to external partners and then draw on the technical assistance of FHI 360 um, to help understand what the locally and culturally appropriate solutions and ideas might be. So it's again, it's a readjustment. It's not necessarily a failure. Yeah, and you know the water industry is is really risk adverse. So adoption of <laughs> new technologies takes a lot of steps along the way. So plenty of failures early on. I think that's it. Fail early because once you get to the facility level, um, the regulatory agencies aren't going to let you test something. So we have a lot of pilot projects that take place that are 
um, in parallel and not serving people per se that test technologies and system trains and different things like that. Um, but the, the early innovation and in technologies is certainly where you see a lot of failures. Our goal is to make sure that the operators aren't the source of the failure. It's really that human error that we worry about the most. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where we're focused a little bit as well. Uh, other questions? Yeah. This is a question for Melissa, I guess, mostly, but I'd be interested in um, uh, responses from the other two panelists. But you mentioned that um, one of the strengths that you felt your organization had was um, your ability to generate quality uh, applied research. Yes. And, and then you also said that uh, one of the things that drove a lot of your activity was a crisis situation. And I would say that Essie shares that first characteristic of you know, wanting to generate good quality applied data. And in fact, one of our uh, key thrusts is to use that data to translate it into something that would lead to better regulatory decision making. Absolutely. The second one, we, we're just now sort of trying to wrap our arms around it. How, how do you do that? And how, what, what's the funding mechanism for a crisis situation and you know, how do we get that off the ground? So I'm interested in, in your ideas about that, but it's a two-part question because the other thing is, do you do any long-term stuff with the eye to perhaps change a regulation or influence a regulation? Absolutely. Um, so on the first one, I'll give you a good example. I mentioned the direct potable reuse uh, initiative, which started about five years ago. Uh, we went actually to the, the, we knew that the state of California, you know, one of the most conservative regulatory states that we have, um, was going to come out with regulations actually um, December of this year. So what did they need in order to develop regulations for direct potable reuse in order to make good regulations? So that's really was the, the, the crisis that we saw, I hate to use that term, but um, and we went uh, to our member agencies and said, you know, this is, a, especially in California, which frankly is 60% of our membership, um, went to those agencies and said, you are going to be regulated by this. If you see this as a future water source, we need to get ahead of it. Um, and we raised about $7 million from those water agencies in California and Texas, and then turned that into $26 million by matching it through our, through our RFP process. Um, so the, and, consulting firms, the um, universities, the people that reply to our RFPs just, you know, match it and bring money to the table just like they do for you. But it was that initial fundraising when the people that would be affected by those regulations that really drove um, the research to make sure that they had the good data that they needed to do that. And the second half of your question I forgot. Hmm. Uh, um, uh, future. Future. For a future. Yes. Um, so, you know, if we look at, um, we use this, I mentioned roadmap, we use this roadmap pop process a lot. So if we look out um, five, 10 plus years, what do we see in the industry? And we've been going through the strategic planning. Um, two of the things actually that were talked about when I got here this afternoon was bioassays. It's a critical need for us. Uh, the regulatory agencies love bioassays. Uh, what's a positive, what's a false, po you know, all these questions we're sitting here going, wait a minute, what, and how do you translate a response in a bioassay to public health? Um, these are the kinds of things that we're grappling with right now and have actually put together a global coalition to look at specifically water and reuse, what bioassays are out there that we could use, what questions are they gonna answer, how do we test them on um, potable systems that are out there to see how, what the response is and actually relate that back to to human impact. So those are, that's a long-term one to me because that's, as you know, millions of dollars of research and a very long step-by-step -step process to get to the point where we can tie that back to a human impact. Um, the other ones that we're looking at are this one water concept. So again, I told you that we focus on wastewater and stormwater. Well, you know, we need to get to planned communities that don't think about things in silos. Even our regulatory EPA isn't totally silos. How do we um, plan for a future that just accepts <coughs> that you know, all water is used? We're drinking dinosaur pee. Um, how, do we, how do we address the system and plan for the best use, fit for purpose water? 
um, you know, and those kinds of things. So what's the planning horizon for that? And a lot of that is policy white papers up front, which will identify research gaps, which will lay out our, our future plan to make sure the agencies have the, the information they need to write good policies. So we're trying to get ahead of the curve. Tim? Yeah, this is a question for all three, and it's about funding. Um, and you don't have to divulge numbers if you don't want to, but uh, I'm just kind of curious about what the funding models are for each of your institutions. I can, I can start. It's a little bit different because we're an endowed foundation. So our funding came from the sale of the, the for-profit company, and now it's, it's managed in an endowment. Um, now, we, now how we fund, however, so it's self-perpetuating through the, through the investments, but we provide about, we, you know, we use the private foundation model. Even though we're a public foundation, we're not beholden to that 5% payout. We do operate under that just to protect the endowment. So, uh, you know, we're about 150 million in, in total assets. We provide probably six to s seven million annually to FHI 360. Um, but one thing that I'm actually working on and exploring with our board and with others is how do we leverage that other 95% of our assets in more strategically and effectively so that we're using that to also enhance human development goals. And that's where we get into that whole conversation with you know, social impact investing, investing in the right companies that are doing the right thing, that are having a positive benefit. Um, making sure that the entrepreneurial ideas are coming to the forefront and more riskier frontiers, you know, let's say in Africa or in Southeast Asia where a lot of traditional investors are a little bit more hesitant to invest. So it's, we're just an exploratory phase, but it's really leveraging your whole tool of financial assets to promote your goals um, and not just operating at a 5%. Yeah, for PATH, um, we're about a $350 million annual operating budget a year. And probably 50% of that comes from the Gates Foundation, so we have a very close tie with them. And the other 50% comes from probably 100 different other sources, and um, including the private sector. So we, we, we kind of work in a few different ways. We can, we, sometimes we put like shared value kinds of propositions where we're working with industry on a shared value thing. They're putting up that something, we're putting up something else and working on a problem together. Uh, sometimes we are working more in a corporate social responsibility kind of uh, atmosphere where people are saying, you know, if you have an extractive industry, for example, they want to work with the communities mm -hmm. where they're um, doing extraction and they want to do a health program, they might just give us money to do that sort of thing. <coughs> um, sometimes we will get money that is not necessarily given to us, but that would de-risk the situation. So you might have uh, almost like an insurance policy. They're called um, they're called program-related investments, um, and you get them from big organizations, big big organizations like the Gates Foundation or other um, foundations. And basically, what they do is they say. Uh, we're not going to give you money up front, but if it doesn't work, we will give you an insurance policy that will come through for you. So an advanced market commitment, for example. You know, you guys produce the vaccine, and if it doesn't sell to this level, we'll guarantee you, you know, uh, to make you whole on that sort of thing. Um, and sometimes we work, uh, you know, sort of where we're partnering with organizations that may not be in our sector and we're bringing different groups together that are, that are providing you know, some funding for it, different pots of funding. When you work for organizations that are largely dependent on foreign assistance as opposed to US domestic um, funding, uh, the foreign assistance funds are really uh, stovepiped. <laughs> And so it's very difficult to get people, not even within your own sector, in the health sector, to actually say like, oh, there's, there's more than one health thing going on here. We ought to pull some HIV money in and some uh, women's empowerment money in and, and some, uh, you know, some reproductive health money. Well, when you start crossing disciplines, where you're talking about agriculture, environment, health, which is the way that the world is going with the Sustainable Development Goals, um, it's even harder to get the, the, the governments to, to do cross purposes like that because they have to be so careful of where they're spending their funding and they have to be able to account for it. So we're, we do try to look for those sorts of creative ways um, to do that. And, and another thing that we're quite interested in looking into are, are um, carbon offsets and health offsets. And these are, uh, you know, 
innovative financing mechanisms that allow us to uh, put programs in place and then have uh, funding that's generated and coming back in over time. And they were very successful when they first started, when the carbon market first started, of course, then the carbon market dropped out. Whether that will come back um, as the environment, I think, is raised <coughs> on the, the global agenda will be interesting to see. Certainly, there's a lot of talk about that, but they are, they are an interesting model for that sort of thing. Completely different. <laughs> Uh, membership dues, federal grants, uh, corporate foundations, uh, state agencies. Just, I know there's another question in the audience, but just to build on that discussion, do you see um, gaps in the funding mechanisms that you need to do your work? Yeah, I think they're like black holes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, th I thought this interesting, it's such, so interesting that you said, you know, crisis is sort of what causes things to happen. As I was thinking about it, I was like, yeah, you know, a lot of things are actually caused by crisis. She said it first. Coupled, <laughs> oh, sorry. I get, I get crisis <laughs> really well. <laughs> uh, yeah, crisis coupled with like really bad policy, yeah. right? I mean, you know, just <laughs> to be really honest, you know, crisis don't happen when people are prepared for them and they're like, okay, we're on this. But when you think about what happens in, in, in public health, HIV, Ebola, Zika, you know, all of these things that are, you know, well within um, probably our ability as, as an organization, as a global organization to think about, oh, we should be prepared for these sorts of things. And in the absence of good global policy, having a, you know, a strong World Health Organization and, 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 and really being ready for those sorts of things. And then local policies on the ground, I mean, I, I'm sure most of you were reading like I was with horror about what was going on with the Ebola virus and, you know, sh neighborhoods being shut down, people trying to be caught up. I mean, you know, just really, really um, not, not great ideas in terms of public health interventions. And I think these are the, the, always, the money always comes because it's like, oh, emergency, you know, now we have to deal with this. There's been a flood or a crisis. Now the people feel sorry and they, they flood the money. But where people should really be thinking, we'd be much more cost effective if we were proactive and if we were being predicted with that. And we were sort of saying like, gosh, you know what? If these are some things that are likely to come up and you know, we ought to be a little bit prepared for this sort of thing. And wouldn't it be great if we have a SWAT team that can go out, and WHO just did this now, uh, on the back of the Ebola crisis, you know, they, they just got, I think, a $500 million fund together to be able to go out and sort of say, like, okay, we need a SWAT team that's going to manage this sort of thing. But I think we don't do that well as a community, you know, really, we really don't. We wait for something to happen and then we respond to it. And it's a classic, um, it's a classic preventive health issue that public health people deal with all the time. And it's very frustrating, I think, because it's like we can see it's like, okay, you guys, but you know, like if we're watching, you know, and, these, and there's trends that are happening right now that we're not paying attention to. Non-communicable diseases have now outpaced communicable diseases as the biggest driver of disability-adjusted life years. And there is not any funding from foreign assistance going towards non-communicable diseases. No funding for foreign assistance. I mean, that's, you know, and, and it's, it's really interesting. Globalization is happening, urbanization is happening, people are still thinking about models that are, you know, much more rural oriented, but cities are going to be where your big problems are come, you know, even, even 10 to 15 years from now. And then things that we don't even think about, like information technology and the availability of data is going to be amazing, like that's going to be huge. But then on the flip side, oh, we have some problems with um, security, right? And the, and the, the the, the nation states that are able to move out of low income status into middle income status have done it largely because they've been stable. But the basket cases, the ones that are really <laughs> tough and where the, the large majority of problems are, they are having a harder time in, in the stability piece of that. And, and that is going to be something that we are really going to have to ha face head on. I mean, it's, we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a world that is changing very quickly. And being able to identify what those trends are and anticipate them and put funding towards them before they become a problem, I think would be, you know, uh, would be a really good use of, of our collective thought. 
Yeah, and if I can just add on that, I mean, all of these crises are somewhat human caused at some level if you really get down to it. Um, and whether we're talking about the global international development setting or even some of our own communities here in the U.S. and, and similarly in, in Europe and in Canada and you know more of the developed countries of the world, there's still these pockets that are going forgotten or or underserved or just ignored completely. So it's I think it's really about giving access to capital to populations and individuals to help them have a positive impact on their own livelihood and well-being, to then help them be more positive participants in their communities and their own health and, you know, it, it's kind of like this, this cycle. But we've, we've been really exploring is like, how do you, how do you get capital to that, that rural young person in Nigeria so that they aren't incentivized to go and join some of these extremist groups? How do you get capital to these, you know, inner city communities? There, there's very little job creation um, and, and growth opportunities to prevent them from getting involved in some negative behaviors and activities. So, but traditional capital isn't getting to those groups and it, there's that risk factor that's involved. So again, there's, there's these foundations, there are some corporate, there are some corporations, there are some more riskier, riskier, excuse me, um, investors that say, look, we're willing to take that risk and show that it can be done. We'll go, we'll provide seed funding and maybe some technical assistance and, and demonstrate, and then hopefully some larger sources of capital will come into that. So it's, you know, it, it's getting to the that health and livelihoods aspect of human development, which I think then has ripple effects on some of these other challenges that we're faced with. Okay, thank you for uh, approaching the black hole question. I think there was one over here. I don't know if I can be heard, yeah. I have a question to Catherine uh, about the vaccine development, within your organization, I'm not quite sure what that means. Uh, because I'm at work being involved in research discovery, rigorous clinical trials and so I know how resource intensive that is. So what do you mean by vaccine development uh, by, uh, in your organization? Yeah, so sometimes we work with big pharma. We work a lot with big pharma. Um, but sometimes, you know, like I'll give you an example. We had a, a young woman who, um, has worked on a, 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 a freeze-dried technology that she's translated from a technology that we've used in humans and she's translated into a heat-stable dispersible tablet for Newcastle disease for chickens. And, uh, and so all the work that she had previously done on human vaccines actually came into play and she was, you know, she's a sprite woman and she sort of figured out how to do it and it's, it's, it's really interesting. Now we're going into clinical trials and we have, um, we have partnered with GalvMed, which is a very, uh, they, they kind of do the health the livestock innovation stuff in the way that we do the health innovation stuff. But certainly, we, we partner with Big Pharma and we do clinical trials. We have a, a, you know, a bevy of uh, um, clinical trial experts who run clinical trials. We have people who work on the policy regulatory environment. Uh, we have deep offices in probably 12 countries where we have study sites and where we can help that. And we do it almost always in partnership with, with Pharma because... Um, so it's more sort of late stage modification or extension? Or Sometimes, yeah, almost always. Uh, we're almost always in the middle of the value chain piece where we're, we're, but not always. Sometimes we are a little bit upstream and sometimes we're in the rollout. I mean, it's, so like when we tell people, we sort of say, well, we kind of work in the middle of the value chain. That's sort of where our sweet spot is. But we actually do, some of the stuff that we work on is upstream development and some of it is, like for things that people don't want, like, um, you know, like, where there's no money to be made, you know, Japanese encephalitis or uh, human papilloma virus when it was first out, you know, they, some, some of that, people, you know, people are afraid of those vaccines, right, for the, pol for the political reason of them. But there are vaccines. The, yes, absolutely, now there are, that's right. But when they, but when, but they weren't on the front line of things, you know, and, and things like, um, you know, things like rotavirus, um, you know, that, 
that <laughs> we're never on the forefront of the developed world agenda, because diarrhea is not a big issue here. But That's not true. That's why I'm <laughs> sorry. Well, Right, we've worked closely with you on that, but we've done, it's not like it was, it wasn't like it was, the, you know, it wasn't like polio where, you know, the, it was on the forefront of what was going on. It was sort of, I think, I think the, the types of vaccines that, that we tend to work on are the ones where there have been not a lot of um, financial incentive for big pharma to get involved or they have been the, um, something that has been related to like Ebola or something, you know, a new and emerging sort of thing. And we always work with, with pharma on that, absolutely. Like, I, I don't want to give the impression that PATH is doing it on its own. We're not. I mean, we're, we're a very small organization yeah, with working with... You cannot do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope I didn't give that impression. I'm, I'm sorry if I did. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So uh, I'll let the two of you have a conversation yeah. that we're done here as well. Like to, I'd actually like to yeah. talk to you afterwards. Yeah. Um, Cyril, you had a question or comment. Yeah, well, I was, I was interested, you know, a couple of times you all um, spoke about, about scaling and, you know, kind of where you are in the value chain. And I think we all have different views of the value chain. If, if you describe yourselves in the middle, I would probably say we're, like, way further back in the middle. Um, and I just wonder, in terms of funding, and this is my my guess, and I'd be curious to get your response, that funding is never easy, but it's easier if you're saying we, are, we want funding to give this, apply this treatment to a water facility or treat these patients, or we're funding, <coughs> excuse me, groundbreaking innovative research. But what about that fuzzy middle piece, so that scaling piece, and that you know, we, we come up with an idea about how do we test it and make sure we can believe it, and how do we know that it's really going to work, and how do we know that developing it for a population in North America is, is going to be safe um, when applied in a different setting. So what about that, that middle ground in terms of um, taking things from the, the novel innovation, sexy science piece to the heartwarming, we're actually delivering it piece. What about that middle piece? Is that something you all struggle to fund, or have you found that people are willing to invest in that broad and sometimes nebulous uh, middle zone? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> or is that too nebulous a question? No, it's a tough one, but it's a good one. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know, I mean, I think there's definitely the means out there. I think it's just identifying it, again, it's these silos, right? There, there's capital, there's funding, there's investment out there. It's just a matter of matching up the right people with the money, with the right ideas and the right part, you know, that, that piece that's missing. Um, one thing that we've done as the foundation, and I think we operate on a very kind of scientific model, is like we have a hypothesis, we test it, you know, we study it, we test it, we demonstrate, and then we work really hard to raise the capital or leverage the capital to help scale it up. So, yeah, I think that's what that middle ground, people in that middle space or that fuzzy space are willing to play, but they want to make sure that it works first. They want to make sure that it's, it is, a, you know, it is scalable. But then I don't think they're very connected to each other. I mean, we're, we're struggling with that in, in you know, in, in, in health service delivery in, in low resource settings in Africa and, and in Southeast Asia, there's, a, there's large investors that want to go in, but they want to go in at the, the advanced stage. They don't want to go in early. They don't want to go in even in the, you know, phase two. Um, so that's where we as the, the foundation community, and I'm speaking on behalf of an entire community right now, so please don't quote me on this. We have the ability to really provide that risk capital to demonstrate and then bring that along. But that's, that's kind of a new way of thinking and a new way of operating because they don't talk to each other. They haven't before. Yeah, and I, I think in philanthropy, mostly they've tried to do that alone for the most part. I mean, Ford Foundation is probably a model of this is the foundation that got it back in the 60s and, you know, over time they've kind of readjusted the way they've done, done things so they haven't really stood out as like this is the group that's brought others along. But I, th I think you see that more and more is using that philanthropic capital to demonstrate and then 
forming those alliances and partnerships with other investors and other funding mechanisms to help scale it up. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, no, it does. Okay. I, you know, to me, it seems like there's, you know, some things when you when you have a really good idea or or you know something that that the global community really wants a vaccine to get out, for example. You know, people that they've built that into the funding, right? You know, because they know that like you're not going to get where you need to be without doing some of that. You know, the, the clinical trials and then and getting broader and broader. I think where it gets difficult is when you're talking about something that's really new and novel, and and then you either have to pitch it, you know, and you've got to go and sort of use your networks and sort of see what's out there. Or you have to respond to, you know, uh, uh, look for and respond to an RFA or an RFP that comes out that's like, well, we're looking for I new ideas like this, you know, and, and, and then, you, you know, you, you, you get lucky. But I think there are a lot of things that, you know, very interesting ideas that when people are, the, the closer you are to the ground and the more you understand what's, what the impediments are to moving things forward, I think the greater the chance of understanding what needs to be done and I know I mean I sat on the other side of the check for 17 years and it's really hard when you're not in the field situation to know like the 60 things you know the level of complication to get something done and relying on people to really say like look this is what it's going to take and I think that 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 comes from trust relationships and from the integrity of your organization and your ability to bring in the right partners and, and think really creatively. But it's, it is hard, yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, again, <coughs> completely different industries, so it's hard to compare. But this is an area where I think we've been <coughs> extremely successful. We have a, a program called LIFT, Leaders in Innovation for Technology, um, that's about connecting um, emerging technologies uh, just beyond bench scale or even at bench scale to getting them on at utilities so that you get that step up um, so that they can be in line for funding if it's successful. Um, been partnering with NSF, DOE, and EPA on a national testbed network um, where we have surveyed the, across the United States at different uh, testbed facilities and where they are in the level of development. So you can actually go on our website and see if you have something that's at a specific <laughs> a specific level of development where in the nation you could approach them to test and do the next phase of your development. So that is an area uh, certainly need more financing to help them in that sort of sweet spot that's not being funded right now. But I think we're trying to fill the void by, by focusing on it. So my computer clock says it's after six, but Michelle has a burning question. <laughs> no, let, let's let this be the last one. Okay. So one question I had is you were talking about the black holes and Cyril's question related to the funding is um, with all of your organizations, you rely on technical experts, like sort of the scientific experts to really help you move this forward, the people that are really moving it forward. But how do you take it from an it's, not meant to be a blanket statement, but from the technical people are not always the one with the access to the largest sources of, of funding, bluntly. And so how do you take the, how do you sort of navigate that from kind of the technical expertise that you need to like, you know, those, those big high level sales pitch kinds of things that you have to do? Um, because they're not always the same people, or in many cases are never the same people need a good translator. <laughs> <laughs> was, what was that one of the things that Hussey's doing right now is translating. <laughs> I think, you know, it's funny. I actually did this for Japaigo. Um, it's a global health organization that is affiliated with Johns Hopkins, largely maternal and child health. And I was the only non-public health professional in the room. And they brought me on board to help raise funds from foundations. I said, well, the only, the, the thing that's <laughs> prohibiting you the most from raising foundation funding is not that you're doing excellent work because you are. It's not that you have, you don't have the best and brightest minds because you do, but you don't know how to talk to people in a language that resonates with them. 
And the best example, and I, I get like eyes rolling when I say this, but I, I remember sitting in on a presentation from our chief medical officer and he kept talking about postpartum hemorrhage. I'm like, okay, I'm a smart person. I get what that means, but I can't fathom the urgency behind it. And I said, well, Harshad, can we just say women bleed to death in pregnancy? You know, and, <laughs> and it was that simple translation. He said, of course, well, I mean, why would we say that? That's not the proper medical term to use. And I said, well, didn't that just paint an image of urgency in your mind? And I think so. It's using those kind of translators, and it's not that the, the technical folks aren't speaking a good language. It's just that they might not be resonating with the audience that they're trying to reach. And I think increasingly organizations are hiring, I mean, you, you know, an organization like PATH, but I, I, I bet yours is the same way, it's not just technical people. It's not a research institution. It's, it, we have people who come from academia, we have people who come from business, we have people who come from the policy side, we have people who come from public health, we have people who come from economics, and really trying to use this multidisciplinary perspective inside to sort of I mean, we're a matrixed organization, probably like most of you guys as well. But it, it is trying to pull on, on some of that, just for the reasons that I think you mentioned. It's really, you have to know who your audience is. And if you don't know who your audience is, then you really don't know how to pitch it. Because uh, certainly if you, if you started saying, people, you know, women are going to bleach death, and you, and you talk to your researchers, they would be like, yeah, we call that postpartum hemorrhage. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is, I think, I think that's part of the trick, is, is trying to figure out how you make it so that, that people who are, are looking at your applications are, um, you know, are spoken to. And I think we spend a lot of time putting together peer review panels for all of our research projects, and those peer review panels are made up of academia, consultants, policy, um, you know, every tier, utility representatives, because they're the ones that are checking in with the project team every quarter. What's the status? Well, I don't understand this. What does that mean? You know, you get different perspectives in that process, and I think it makes a better research project in the end. With that, um, I want to thank you all. This has been, I think, a very enlightening and, and kind of fun session. So would you all please join me in thanking Melissa, Catherine, and Heather. <laughs>